Não, não, não. What parallel courses did Bloom and Stephen follow returning? Starting united both at normal walking pace from Bearsford Place. They followed in the order named Lower and Middle Gardner Streets and Mountjoy Square West. Then, at reduced pace, each bearing left Gardner's Place by an inadvertence as far as the farthest corner at Temple Street. Then, at reduced pace, with interruptions of halt, bearing right Temple Street North as far as Hardwick Place, approaching disparate. At relaxed walking pace, they cross both the circus before George's church diametrically, the cord in any circle being less than the act which it subtends. Did Bloom discover common factors of similarity between their respective like and unlike reactions to experience? Both were sensitive to artistic impressions, musical in preference to plastic or pictorial. Both preferred a continental to an insular manner of life, a cisatlantic to a transatlantic place of residence. Both indurated by early domestic training and an adherent tenacity of heterodox resistance professed their disbelief in many orthodox religious, national, social, and ethical doctrines. Both admitted the alternately stimulating and obtunding influence of heterosexual magnetism. Were their views on some points divergent? Stephen dissented openly from Bloom's views on the importance of dietary and civic self-help, while Bloom dissented tacitly from Stephen's views on the eternal affirmation of the spirit of man in literature. What act did Bloom make on their arrival at their destination? At the house steps of the fourth of the equidifferent uneven numbers, number seven, Eccles Street, he inserted his hand mechanically into the back pocket of his trousers to obtain his latch key. Was it there? It was in the corresponding pocket of the trousers which he had worn on the day but one preceding. Why was he doubly irritated? Because he had forgotten and because he remembered that he had reminded himself twice not to forget. What were then the alternatives before the premeditatedly, respectively, and inadvertently keyless couple? To enter or not to enter, to knock or not to knock. Bloom's decision. A stratagem. Resting his feet on the dwarf wall, he climbed over the area railings, compressed his hat on his head, grasped the two points at the lower union of rails and stiles, lowered his body gradually by its length of five feet, nine inches and a half, to within two feet, ten inches of the area pavement, and allowed his body to move freely in space by separating himself from the railings and crouching in preparation for the impact of the fall. Did he arise uninjured by concussion? Regaining new stable equilibrium, he rose uninjured though concussed by the impact, raised the latch of the area door, gained retarded access to the kitchen through the subjacent scullery, and lit a portable candle. Did the man reappear elsewhere? After a lapse of four minutes, the glimmer of his candle was discernible through the semi-transparent, se semi-circular glass of the fan light above the hall door. The hall door torn gradually on its hinges. In the open space of the doorway, the man reappeared without his hat, with his candle. Which seemed to be, to the horse, to be the predominant qualities of his guest? Confidence in himself, an equal and opposite power of abandonment and recuperation. How did Bloom prepare a collation for a Gentile? He poured into two teacups, two level spoonfuls, four in all of Epsis, soluble cocoa, and proceeded according to the directions for use printed on the label, to each adding after sufficient time for infusion, the prescribed ingredients for diffusion, in the manner and the quantity prescribed. Was the guest conscious of, and did he acknowledge these marks of hospitality? His attention was directed to them by his host, jocosely, and he accepted them seriously. As they drank in joco serious silence, Epps's mass product, the crater cocoa. What celebration accompany Bloom's frequentative act? 
Well, concluding by inspection, but erroneously, that his silent companion was engaged in mental composition, he reflected on the pleasures derived from literature of instruction rather than of amusement, as he himself had applied to the works of William Shakespeare more than once for the solution of difficult problems in imaginary or real life. Had he found their solution? In spite of careful and repeated reading of certain classical passages, aided by a glossary, he had derived imperfect conviction from the text, the answers not bearing on all points. What lines concluded his first piece of original verse written by him, potential poet at the age of 11 in 1877, on the occasion of the offering of three prizes of 10 shillings, 5 shillings and 2 and 6 pence respectively, for the competition by, given by the Shamrock a weekly newspaper. An ambition to squint at me verses in print makes me hope that for these you'll find room. If you so condescend, then please place at the end the name of yours truly, El Bluem. What anagrams had he made on his name in youth? Leopold Bloom. El Padbamur. Moldopalu. Moldopadum. Old Olebo, MP. What acrostic upon the abbreviations of his first name had he, kinetic poet, sent to Miss Marion Molly Tweedy on the 14th of February 1888? Poets oft have sung in rhyme. Of music sweet their praise divine. Let them hymn it nine times nine. Dear far than song or wine. You are mine. The, the world, world is mine. mine. <laughs> How many previous encounters between host and guest prove their pre-existing acquaintance? Two. The first in a lilac garden at Matthew Dillon's house, Medina Village, Kimmage Road, round town in 1887, in the company of Stephen's mother, Stephen being then of the age of five and reluctant to give his hand in salutation. The second in a coffee room of Breslin's Hotel on a rainy Sunday in January of 1892 in the company of Stephen's father and Stephen's grand uncle, Stephen being then five years elder. Did Bloom accept the invitation to dinner given then by the son and afterwards seconded by the father? Very gratefully, with grateful appreciation with sincere appreciative gratitude, in appreciatively grateful sincerity of regret, he declined. What, reduced to their simplest reciprocal form, were Bloom's thoughts about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom, and about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom's thoughts about Stephen? He thought that he thought that he was a Jew, whereas he knew that he knew that he knew that he was not. What the enclosures of reticence removed were their respective parentages. Bloom, only born male, transubstantial heir of Rudolf Virag, subsequently Rudolf Bloom, of Sam Bailey, Vienna, Budapest, Milan, London and Dublin, and of Ellen Higgins, second daughter of Julius Higgins, born Cowling, and Fanny Higgins, born Hegarty. Stephen, elder surviving male, consubstantial heir of Simon, Simon Dennis of Cork and Dublin, and of Mary, daughter of Richard and Christina Goulding, born the rear. What two temperaments did they individually represent? The scientific, the artistic. What suggested scene was then constructed by Stephen? Solitary hotel in Mountain Pass. Autumn, twilight. Fire lit. In dark corner, young man seated. Young woman enters. He's restless, solitary. She sits. She goes to window. She stands. She sits. She, twilight. She thinks. On solitary hotel paper, she writes. She thinks. She writes. She sighs. Wheels and hoofs. She hurries out. He comes from his dark corner. He sees his solitary paper. He holds it towards fire. Twilight. He reads solitary. What? In sloping, upright and back hands. Queen's Hotel. Queen's Hotel. Queen's Hotel. Queen's Hotel. Queen's Hotel what suggested Queen's scene Hotel. was in reconstructed by Bloom? The Queen's Hotel, Ennis County Clare. 
where Rudolf Bloom, Rudolf Virag, died on the evening of the 27th of June 1886 at some hour unstated in consequence of an overdose of monkshood, aconite, self-administered in the form of a neuralgic liniment composed of two parts aconite liniment to one of chloroform liniment purchased by him at 10.20 a.m. on the morning of the 27th of June 1886 at the Medical Hall of Francis Dennehy, 17 Church Street, Ennis. After having, though not in consequence of having, purchased at 3.15 p.m. on the afternoon of the 27th of June 1886 a new Bota straw hat, extra smart. After having, though not in consequence of having, purchased at the hour and in the place aforesaid, the toxin aforesaid, at the general drapery store of James Cullen 4, Main Street, Ennis. Accepting the analogy implied in the guest's parable, which examples of post-exilic eminence did he adduce? Three seekers of the pure truth. Moses of Egypt, Moses My Money Days, author of Mori Nebuchim, guide of the perplexed. And Moses Mendelssohn, of such eminence that from Moses of Egypt to Moses Mendelssohn, there arose none like Moses Maimonides. days. Uh, what fragments of verse from the ancient Hebrew and ancient Irish languages were cited with modulations of voice and translation of texts by guest to host and by host to guest? By Stephen. Shul, shul, shul arun, shul go sucker, agas shul go kuen. By Bloom. Kifeloch, harimon ratkatech, mbad lazamitech. Thy temple amid thy hair is as a slice of pomegranate. What was Stephen's auditive sensation? He heard in a profound ancient male, unfamiliar melody, the accumulation of the past. What was Bloom's visual sensation? He saw in a quick young male familiar form the predestination of a future. Did the host encourage his guest to chant in a modulated voice a strange legend on an allied theme? Reassuringly, that their place, where none could hear them talk, being secluded, reassured the decocted beverages, allowing for sub-solid residual sediment of a mechanical nature, water plus sugar plus cream plus cocoa having been consumed. Recite the first major part of the chanted legend. Little Harry Hughes and his schoolfellas all went out for to play ball. And the very first ball little Harry Hughes played, he drove it over the Jude's garden wall. And the very second ball little Harry Hughes played, he broke the Jews' windows all. <laughs> How did the son of Rudolph receive this first part? Ah, with unmixed feeling, spoiling, a Jew, he heard with pleasure and saw the unbroken kitchen window. Recite the second part, minor, of the legend. Then out there came the Jew's daughter, and she all dressed in green. Come back, come back, you pretty little boy, and play your ball again. I can't come back, and I won't come back without me schoolfellas all. For if me master heeded here, he'd make it a sorry ball. She took him by the lily-white hand and led him along the hall, until she led him to a room where none could hear him call. He took a penknife out of her pocket and cut off his little head. And now he'll play his ball no more, for he lies among the dead. <laughs> How did the father of Millicent receive this second part? With mixed feelings, unsmiling. He heard and saw with wonder a Jew's daughter, all dressed in green. What proposal did Bloom, diambulist, father of Millie, somnambulist, make to Stephen, noctambulist? To pass in repose the hours between Thursday, proper, and Friday, normal, on an extemporized cubicle in the apartment immediately above the kitchen and immediately adjacent to the sleeping apartment of his host and hostess. Was the proposal of asylum accepted? Promptly, inexplicably, with amicability, gratefully it was declined. 
Why would a recurrent frustration the more depress him? Because at the critical turning point of human existence, he desired to amend many social conditions, the product of inequality and avarice and international animosity. Why did he desist from speculation? Because it was a task for a superior intelligence to substitute other more acceptable phenomena in the place of the less acceptable phenomena to be removed. Did Stephen participate in his dejection? He affirmed his existence as a conscious, rational animal proceeding syllogistically from the known to the unknown and a conscious, rational reagent between a micro and a macrocosm ineluctably constructed upon the incertitude of the void. Was this affirmation apprehended by Bloom? Not verbally, substantially. What comforted his misapprehension? That as a competent keyless citizen, he had proceeded energetically from the unknown to the known through the incertitude of the void. What did each do at the door of egress? Bloom set the candlestick on the floor. Stephen put his hat on his head. What spectacle confronted them when they, first the host, then the guest, emerged silently, doubly dark, from obscurity by a passage from the rear of the house into the penumbra of the garden? The heaven tree of stars hung with humid night blue fruit. His, Bloom's, logical conclusion, having weighed the matter and allowing for possible error, that it was not a heaven tree, not a heaven grot, not a heaven beast, not a heaven man. That it was a utopia, there being no known method from the known to the unknown, an infinity renderable equally finite by the suppositious apposition of one or more bodies equally of the same and different magnitudes. A mobility of illusory forms immobilized in space remobilized in air, a past which possibly had ceased to exist as a present before its probable spectators had entered actual present existence. Was he more convinced of the aesthetic value of the spectacle? Ah, indubitably, in consequence of the reiterated examples of poets in the delirium of the frenzy of attachment or in the abasement of rejection invoking ardent sympathetic constellations or the frigidity of the satellite of their planet. What visible luminous sign attracted Bloom's who attracted Stephen's gaze? In a second story rear of his Bloom's house, the light of a paraffin oil lamp with oblique shade projected on a screen of roller blind supplied by Frank O'Hara, window blind curtain pole and revolving shutter manufacturer 16 Angel Street. How did he elucidate the mystery of an invisible, attractive person, his wife Marion, Molly Bloom, denoted by a visible, splendid sign, a lamp, with indirect and direct verbal allusions or affirmations, with subdued affection and admiration, with description, with impediment, with suggestion? Both were then silent. Silent, each contemplating the other in both mirrors of the reciprocal flesh of their his, not his fellow faces. Were they indefinitely inactive? At Stephen's suggestion, at Bloom's instigation, both for Stephen, then Bloom, in penumbra urinated, their sides contiguous, their organs of micturition reciprocally rendered invisible by manual circumposition, their gazes, first Bloom's, then Stephen's, elevated to the projected luminous and semi-luminous shadow. Similarly, the trajectories of their first sequent, then simultaneous urinations were dissimilar. Bloom's longer, less irruent, in the incomplete form of the bifurcated penultimate alphabetical letter, who, in his ultimate year at high school, 1880, had been capable of attaining the point of greatest altitude against the whole concurrent strength of the institution, 120 scholars, 210 scholars. Mm. Stevens, higher, more sibilant, who in the ultimate hours of the previous day had augmented by diuretic consumption an insistent vesicle pressure. 
What different problems presented themselves to each concerning the invisible, audible, collateral organ of the other? To Bloom, the problems of irritability, tumescence, rigidity, reactivity, dimension, sanitariness, pilosity. To Stephen, the problems of the sacerdotal integrity of Jesus circumcised. One January, holiday of obligation to hear Mass and abstain from unnecessary servile work. And the problem as to whether the divine prepuce, the carnal bridal ring of the Holy Roman Apostolic Church, conserved in Calcutta, were deserving of simple, simple hyperduly or of the fourth degree of latria, according to the abscission of such divine excrescences as hair and toenails. What celestial sign was by both simultaneously observed? A star precipitated with great apparent velocity across the firmament from Vega in the Lyre, above the zenith beyond the star group of the Tress of Berenice, towards the zodiacal sign of Leo. <laughs> How did they take their leave one of the other in separation? Standing perpendicular at the same door and on different sides of its base, the loins of their valedictory arms meeting at any point and forming any angle less than the sum of two right angles. What sound accompanied the union of their tangent, the disunion of their respectively centrifugal and centripetal hands? The sound of the peal of the hour of the night by the chime of the bells in the church of St. George. What echoes of that sound were by both in each horde? By Stephen. Liliata rutilantium, turma circum det, jubilantium te virginum, chorus excipiat. By Bloom. Hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho. Alone, what did Bloom hear? The double reverberation of retreating feet on the heaven born earth. The double vibration of a Jew's harp in the resonant lane. Alone, what did Bloom feel? The cold of interstellar space, thousands of degrees below freezing point, or the absolute zero of Fahrenheit, centigrade, or Riamour. The incipient intimations of proximate dawn. Of what did bell chime and hand touch and footstep and lone chill remind him? Of companions now in various manners in different places defunct. Percy Apjohn, killed in action, Mother River. Philip Gilligan, Thysis, Jervis Street Hospital. Matthew F. Kane, accidental drowning, Dublin Bay. Philip Boisel, Poemia, Hatesbury Street. Michael Hart, Thysis, Mis Marta Misericordiae Hospital. Patrick Dignam, apoplexy, Sandy Mount. Did he remain? With deep inspiration, he returned, retraversing the garden, re-entering the passage, re-closing the door. With brief suspiration, he reassumed the candle, reascended the stairs, reapproached the door of the front room, hall floor, and re-entered. What suddenly arrested his ingress? The right temporal lobe of the hollow sphere of his cranium came into contact with a solid timber angle where, an infinitesimal but sensible fraction of a second later, a painful sensation was located in consequence of antecedent sensations transmitted and registered. What composite asymmetrical image in the mirror then attracted his attention? The image of a solitary, ipso relative, mutable, alio relative man. Why solitary, ipso relative? Brothers and sisters, had he known yet that man's father was his grandfather's son. Why mutable, alio relative? From infancy to maturity, he had resembled his maternal procreatrix. From maturity to senility, he would increasingly resemble his paternal procreator. What were habitually his final meditations? Of some one sole unique advertisement to cause passers to stop in wonder. A poster novelty with all extraneous accretions excluded, reduced to its simplest and most efficient terms, not exceeding the span of casual vision and congress with the velocity of modern life. What possibility suggested itself? 
The possibility of exercising virile power of fascination in the not immediate future, after an expensive repast in a private apartment, in the company of an elegant courtesan of corporal beauty, moderately mercenary, variously instructed, a lady by origin. Why did Bloom experience a sentiment of remorse? Because in immature impatience he had treated with disrespect certain beliefs and practices. As? The prohibition of the use of flesh meat and milk at one meal. The hebdomadary symposium of incoordinately abstract, perfividly concrete, mercantile co-ex-religious ex-compatriots. The circumcision of male infants. The supernatural character of Judaic scripture, the ineffability of the tetragrammaton, the sanctity of the Sabbath. How did these beliefs and practices now appear to him? Not more rational than they had then appeared, not less rational than other beliefs and practices now appeared. What universal binomial denomination would be his as entity and non-entity? Assumed by any or known to none, every man or no man. What tributes his? Honour and gifts of strangers, the friends of every man. A nymph immortal, beauty, the bride of no man. What past consecutive causes before rising pre-apprehended of accumulated fatigue did Bloom before rising silently recapitulate the preparation of breakfast burnt offering intestinal congestion and premeditative defecation holy of holies the bath right of John the funeral right of Samuel the advertisement of Alexander Keys Urim and Thummim the unsubstantial lunch right of Melchizedek the visit to museum and library Holy place. The book hunt along Bedford Row, Merchant's Arch, Wellington Quay. Simchath Torah. The music in the Arman Hotel. Shira Shirim. The altercation with a truggular truggerodite in Born and Kiernan's premises. Holocaust. A blank period of time, including a car drive, a visit to a house of mourning, a leave taking. Wilderness. The eroticism produced by feminine exhibitionism. Right of Onan. The prolonged delivery of Mrs. Mina Purify. Heave offering. The visit to the disorderly house of Mrs. Bella Cohen, 82 Chiron Street, Lower, and subsequent brawl, and Chance Medley in Beaver Street. Armageddon! Nocturnal perambulation to and from the cabman shelter but bridge. Atonement. What self-evident enigma, pondered with desultory constancy during 30 years, did Bloom now, having effected natural obscurity by the extinction of artificial light, silently, suddenly comprehend? Where was Moses when the lights went out? <laughs> Bloom's axe. He deposited articles of clothing on a chair, removed his remaining articles of clothing, took from beneath the bolster at the head of the bed a folded long white nightshirt, inserted his head and arms into the proper apertures of the nightshirt, removed a pillow from the head to the foot of the bed, prepared the bed linen accordingly, and entered the bed. How? With circumspection, as invariably when entering a boat, his own or not his own, with solicitude. The snake spiral springs of the mattress being old, the brass quites and pendant viper radii loose and tremulous under stress and strain, prudently, as entering a lair or ambush of lust or adders, lightly, the less to disturb, reverently, the better conception and a birth of consummation of marriage and breach of marriage, of sleep and death. With what antagonistic sentiments were his subsequent reflections affected? Envy, jealousy, abnegation, equanimity. Why more abnegation than jealousy? Less envy than equanimity. From outrage matrimony to outrage adultery, there arose naught but outrage copulation. Yet, 
the matrimonial violator of the matrimonially violated had not been outraged by the adulterous violator of the adulterously violated. In what final satisfaction did these antagonistic sentiments and reflections, reduced to their simplest form, converge? Satisfaction at the ubiquity in eastern and western terrestrial hemispheres, in all habitable lands and islands, explored or unexplored, the land of the midnight sun, the islands of the blessed, the isles of Greece, the land of promise, of adipose anterior and posterior, female hemispheres, redolent of milk and honey and of excretory sanguine and seminal warmth, reminiscent of secular families of curves of amplitude, insusceptible of moods of impression, expressive of moot, immutable, mature animality. The visible signs of anti-satisfaction. An approximate erection. A solicitous adversion, a gradual elevation, a tentative revelation, a silent contemplation. Then? He kissed the plump, mellow, yellow, smellow melons of her rump on each plump, melanous hemisphere in their mellow, yellow furrow with obscure, prolonged, provocative, melons, melanous osculation. The, 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 the visible signs of post-satisfaction. A silent contemplation, a tentative velation, a gradual abasement, a solicitous adversion, a proximate erection. What followed this silent action? Somnolent invocation, less somnolent recognition, incipient excitation, catechetical interrogation. Which event or person emerged as the salient point of this narration? Stephen Dedalus, professor and author. What? Move visibly above the listeners and the narrator's invisible thoughts. The upcast reflection of a lamp and shade, an inconstant series of concentric circles of varying gradations of light and shadow. In what direction did listener and narrator lie? Listener, southeast by east, narrator, northwest by west, on the 53rd parallel of latitude north and 6th meridian of longitude west at an angle of 45 degrees to the terrestrial equator. In what state of rest or motion? At rest relatively to themselves and to each other, in motion being each and both carried westward, forward, rearward respectively, by the proper perpetual motion of the earth through ever-changing tracks of never-changing space. In what posture? Listener, reclined semi-laterally left, left hand under head, right leg extended in a straight line, and resting on left leg, flexed in the attitude of Gaia Tellus, fulfilled, recumbent, big with seed. Narrator, reclined laterally left, with right and left leg flexed, the index finger and thumb of the right hand resting on the bridge of the nose, in the attitude depicted in a snapshot photograph made by Percy Apjohn, the child man weary, the man child in the womb. Womb? Weary? He rests. He has traveled. With? Sinbad the sailor and... Timbad the tailor and... Jinbad the jailer and... Winbad the whaler and... Binbad the nailer and... Finbad the failer and... Binbad the bailer and... Pinbad the paler and... Binbad the mailer and... Hinbad the hailer and... Rinbad the jailer and... Dimbad the kailer and... Finbad the quailer and... Limbad the yailer and... Shinbad the failer. When? Going to dark bed. There was a square round, Sinbad the sailor, rocks, ox, egg, in the night of the bed, of all the ox, of the rocks, of dark in bad, the bright tailor. Where? Where? Why can't you kiss a man without going and 
marrying him. <clears throat> First, you sometimes love too wildly, and when you feel that way so nice all over, you can't help yourself. I wish some man or other would take me sometime when he's there and kiss me in his arms. Oh, there's nothing like a kiss, long and hot, down to your soul. It almost paralyzes you. And then, I hate that confession. When I used to go to Father Corrigan, he touched me, Father. <laughs> and what harm if he did? Where? On the canal bank. <laughs> That's what I said, like a fool. But whereabouts on your person, my child? On the leg behind. Was it high up? Yes, rather high up. Was it where you sit down? Ah, oh, why couldn't he have just come out and say bottom right out and have done with it? Oh, Lord. What has that got to do with it? Whatever way he put it, and, 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 and what business did it make? And I said, no, no, father. And I always think of the real father. What did he need to know for? I already confessed it to God. He had a nice fat hand, the palm moist always. <laughs> Wouldn't mind feeling it either. Neither would he, I would say, by the bull neck and his horse collar. I wonder, did he see me in the box? I could see his face, of course. He couldn't see mine. Now, he'd never turn and let on, but his eyes were red when his father died. They're lost for a woman, most of them. It must be terrible when a man cries, let alone them. I'd like to be embraced by one in his vestments and the smell of incense off him like the Pope. Besides, there's no danger with a priest. He's too careful about himself. And then give something to the Pope for a penance. <clears throat> I wonder, was he satisfied with me? For one thing, I didn't like him slapping me behind, going away so familiarly like that in the hall. And though I laughed, I'm not a horse or an ass, am I? Suppose he was thinking of his father. I wonder, is he awake, thinking of me? Or dreaming? Am I in it? Hmm? I wonder who gave him that flower he said he bought. He smelt of some kind of drink, not, not whiskey or stout, but perhaps that other kind of, uh, the, the sweetie kind of paste. They stick up their bills with some liqueur, yeah. I'd like to sip those rich-looking green and yellow expensive drinks, those stage door Johnny with the top hat drinks with the opera hats. I tasted one with my finger. I dipped it out with my hand. One of that American that had that squirrel talking stamps with father. <laughs> he had all he could do to keep himself from falling asleep. After that last time we had the port and the potted meat had, had, had a fine salty taste. Yes, because I felt lovely and tired myself and I fell asleep sound as a top until that thunder woke me up as if the world was coming to an end. Oh, I thought the heavens were coming down about us to punish when I blessed myself. I said a Hail Mary like those awful thunderstorms that we used to have in Gibraltar. And then they come and they tell you there's no God. Wait. There's George's church. Wait. Three quarters the hour. Wait. Two o'clock. Well. That's a nice hour for him to be coming back to. To anybody. Climbing down the stairs, looking about in the area. Did anyone see him? Knock him off that little habit tomorrow. First, I'll look at his shirt. I'll see if he has that French letter still in his pocketbook. I suppose he thinks I don't know. Deceitful men. All their twenty pockets aren't enough for their lies. Why should we tell them? Even if it's the truth, they don't believe us. 
and then tucked up in bed like one of those babies in the aristocrat's masterpiece he brought me another time, as if we hadn't enough of that in real life without some old aristocrat or whatever his name is disgusting you with those morals rotten pictures. Children with two heads and, and no legs. Now, that's the kind of villainy they're always dreaming about with not another thing in their empty heads. They ought to get slow poison, the lot of them. Mm. <sighs> Then tea and toast for him in the morning, I suppose, buttered on both sides, new, legs, e new laid eggs, and I suppose I'm nothing anymore. When I wouldn't let him lick me that time in Hollis Street one night, man, man, tyrant as ever. For the one thing, he slept on the floor half the night, naked the way the Jews used to when somebody dies belonged to them, and he wouldn't eat any breakfast or speak a word wanting to be petted, so I thought I stood out for the one time and I let him. He does it all wrong, too. Thinking only of his own pleasure. His tongue is too flat, or I, I, I don't know what. He forgets the wet, and well, I don't. I'll make him do it again, if he doesn't mind himself. And I'll lock him down in the cellar with the black beetles. I wonder, was it her? Josie Offerhead, that barmaid. Oh, of course his wife is always sick. Oh, just getting better of it. And he has, he's, he's a good looking man too, although he's getting a bit gray around the ears. Ah, oh, they're a nice lot, a lot of them, all trying to get my husband to get into their clutches. Well, not if I can help it. Making fun of him behind his back. And then I know well when he goes on with his idiotics because he has sense enough not to squander every penny piece he earns down their gullets and he looks after his wife and family. Good for nothing's poor Paddy Dignam all the same. I'm sorry in a way for him. What are his wife and five children going to do? Unless he was insured. <laughs> Comical little teetotal of a man, always stuck up in some pub corner and, and her or her son waiting. <laughs> Bill Bailey, won't you please come home? <laughs> oh. I suppose he'd go into mourning, even for the cat. <laughs> And I suppose he's a man now. By this time, he was an innocent little boy when I saw him last in his Lord Fauntleroy suit and the, the curly hair like the prince on the stage when I saw him at Matt Dillon's. He liked me too. <laughs> well, I remember. Of course, they all do. Wait. By God. Yes, wait. Yes. Hold on. He was on the cards this morning when I laid out the deck. Union with a young stranger. Neither dark nor fair. You met before. <laughs> oh, I, I, this, I, I, I thought it meant him, but, but he's no chicken. Nor a stranger either. Besides, my face was turned the other way. What was the seventh card after that? The ten of spades for a journey by land, and the, there was a letter on its way, and, and scandals too. The three queens and the eight of diamonds for a rise in society. Yes, well, it all came out. And two red eights for a new garments. Look at that. And didn't I dream something too? Wait. Yes, there, there was something about poetry in it. I hope he hasn't long, greasy hair hanging into his eyes or, or standing up like a red Indian. What do they go about like that for? Just the kittens themselves and their poetry laughed at. Uh, I always liked poetry when I was a girl. First, I thought he was a poet, like Lord Byron and not an ounce of it in his composition. I thought he was quite different, too. He's about, wait, 88. Uh, I was married, 88. Millie is 15 yesterday. 
89. What age was he then, at Dylan's? Four or five? Well, I suppose he's 20 or more now. Uh, I'm not too old for him. If he's 23 or 24. I hope he doesn't have that stuck-up university student sort. No. Otherwise, he wouldn't have stayed with him and sitting down in the old kitchen talking, the Epsis Coco talking. Of course, he pretended to understand it all. He probably told him he was a professor of Trinity College. <laughs> he's very young to be a professor. I hope he's not a professor like Goodwin was. Oh, he was a fine, potent professor of John Jameson. They all write about some woman in their poetry. Well, I suppose he won't find many like me. Where softly sighs of love, the light guitar. Where poetry's in the air and the blue sea and the moon shining so beautifully. Coming back, the night boat from Tarifa, the lighthouse at Europa Point, the guitar that fella played so expressive. Will I ever go back there again? All new faces, two glancing eyes, a lattice hid, <laughs> as darkly bright as love's own star. Aren't those beautiful words? As love's own star. <laughs> well, it'll be a change, the Lord knows, to have someone intelligent to talk to about yourself, not always listening to him, and Billy Prescott's ad, and the Keys' ad, and Tom the Devil's ad, and then if anything goes wrong in their business, we have to suffer. I'm sure he's very distinguished. I'd like to meet a man like that. Not like those other... God, besides, he is young. Oh, those fine young men I could see down in Margaret's Strand bathing place from the side of the rock, standing up in the sun, naked like a, a god or something, and then plunging into the sea with them. Oh, why aren't all men like that? There'd be some consolation for a woman that lovely little statue that he brought. Oh, now I could look at him all day, curly head and his shoulders and his finger up for you to listen. Oh, there's real beauty in that and poetry for you. I, <laughs> I often felt I wanted to kiss him all over. Also his lovely young cock there, so simple. I wouldn't mind taking him in my mouth. If nobody was looking. It looks as if it was asking you to suck it. So clean and white, he looked with his boyish face. I would, too, in half a minute, and even if some of it went down. <coughs> what? <coughs> it's only like... <coughs> gruel. <laughs> or the dew. <laughs> uh, there's no danger. Besides, he'd be so clean compared to the rest of those pigs of men, I suppose never dream of washing it from one week to the another. Only, oh, that's what gives the women the mustaches. I'm sure of it. Um, I'm sure it'll be grand if I can only get with a nice, handsome poet at my age. Mm. I'll, I'll throw the cards first thing in the morning. And I, I'll try pairing the lady herself and see if he comes out. And I'll read and study all I can. I'll find out or learn a bit off by heart. If I knew who he liked, he won't think me stupid. If he thinks all women are the same and, and I can teach him the other part, uh, I'll make him feel all over till he half faints under me and then... He He'll write about me <laughs> and a lover and is his mistress publicly too with our, our two photographs in the paper when he becomes famous. Oh, but then what am I to do about him though?
Mwah! That is no way for him. Has he no manners, nor no, no refinement, nor no nothing in his nature slapping us behind like that on me bottom because I didn't call him Hugh. Ignoramus doesn't know poetry from a cabbage. That's what you get for not keeping him in their place. Pulling off his shoes and his trousers. There on the chair before me, so barefaced, without even asking permission and standing out in that vulgar way they have to be admired in that shirt, like a, like a priest or a butcher or those old hypocrites in the time of Julius Caesar. Uh, of course, he's right enough to pass the time with as a joke. <laughs> sure, you, you might as well have a conversation with a lion, and I suppose he would have even more for him to say, an old lion would, oh, well... I suppose it's because they're so plump and tempting in these short petticoats. Hmm. He couldn't resist. They excite myself sometimes. <laughs> it's well, all the pleasure that men get out of a woman's body. They're so round and white. For them, always, I... I wished I was one myself, just, just for a change, you know, to, just to try with that, that thing they have swelling up on you so hard and, and at the same time so soft. Oh, when you touch it. My Uncle John has a thing long. I heard those corner boys singing when I passed by, thinking that I didn't hear on Matter of Own Lane. My Aunt Mary has a thing hairy. And as it was dark, they knew a girl was passing. Didn't make me blush. Why should it either? It's only, it's only nature. And, and he, he puts his thing long into my Aunt Mary's hairy, etc., and turns out, you put the handle in the sweeping brush, men all over again. They can pick and choose what they want, a married woman, or a fast widow, or a girl, for their different tastes. But, but we, we're, no, we're always to be chained up. Well, they're not going to be chaining me up, I can tell you that, no damn fear, once I tell you. For stupid husband's jealousy, why can't we just all remain friends over it instead of quarrelling? Her husband found out what they did together. Well, naturally, and can he undo it? He's Coronado, anyway, whatever he does. And then he, going off to the mad extreme about the wife and fair tyrants. Now, of course, the man never casts a thought to what the, the husband or, or, or the wife either. No, it's the woman he wants, and he gets her. What else are we given all these desires for, I'd like to know? I can't help it if I'm young still. Can I? <laughs> I'm lucky I'm not an old shriveled hag before me time living with him who'd never embracing me so cold, never embracing me except sometimes when he's asleep. The wrong end of me. <laughs> Probably not knowing, I suppose, who he has. Any man that had Kiss a woman's bottom, I'd throw me hat at him. Oh. After that, he'd kiss anything unnatural, but we haven't one atom of any kind of expression in us, all the same, two lumps of lard. Before I do that to any man, <laughs> I'd like a dirty brute. Mere, mere thought is enough. I kissed the feet of you, senorita. There's some sense in that. Didn't he kiss our hall door? Yes. <laughs> he did. Oh, what a madman. Nobody understands his cracked ideas except for me. Still, a woman wants to be embraced 20 times a day almost to make her feel young, look young, no matter by who, so long as to be in love or loved by somebody, if the fella you want isn't there. <laughs> Sometimes, by the Lord God, I was thinking, would I go around by the keys there, 
Some dark evening. Nobody'd know me. And I'd... I'd pick up a sailor off the sea. <laughs> You'd be hot on for it. He'd not care a pin whose I was. Only do it up off in some gate somewhere. <laughs> or, or, or one of those wild-looking gypsies at Rat Farman. They had their camps pitched near the Bloomfield Laundry to try and steal our things if they could. Now, I only set mine there once for the name. Model Laundry. Send it me back over and over. Some old ones, odd stockings. Ooh. That blackguard-looking fellow with the fine eyes. With the switch, peel in the switch. Attack me in the dark and ride me up against the wall without a word. Oh. Or a murderer. Anybody? What they do themselves. The fine gentlemen in their silk hats. That KC lives somewhere up this way, coming out of Hardwick Lane. The night he gave us the fish supper on account of winning over the boxing match. Of course, it was for me that he gave it. Now, I knew him by his gaiters and the walk. And when I turned around just a minute to see just after him, some filthy prostitute, then he goes home to his wife after that. Huh? Oh, only I suppose... Half those sailors are, are rotten with disease. Oh. Oh. Move your big carcass out of that, for the love of God. <laughs> Listen to him. The winds that waft my sighs to thee. So well may he sleep, the great... Holdo de la Flora, if he knew how the cards came out for him this morning, he'd have something to sigh for. A dark man in some perplexity between two sevens, too, in prison, for the Lord knows what he does that I don't know, and I'm to be sleeching around down in the kitchen to get his lordship his breakfast while he's rolled up like a mummy, too. would like to see me self at it. You show them some attention. They treat you like dirt. I don't care what anybody says. It'd be much better for the world to be governed by the women. In it, you wouldn't see women going and, and killing each other and slaughtering each other. When do you ever see women rolling around drunk like they do or gambling every penny piece they have and losing it on horses? Yes, because a woman, whatever she does, she knows when to stop. Sure. They wouldn't be in the world at all if it weren't for women. If they hadn't had a mother to look after them. What I never had. That's why he's out running wild now. Out at night, away from his books. On account of the usual rowy house that he's living in, I suppose. Well, it's a poor case. Those that have a fine son like that and they're not satisfied and I have none. Was he not able to make one? It wasn't my fault. We came together when I was watching the two dogs up in her behind in the middle of the naked street. That disheartened me altogether. I suppose I shouldn't have buried him in that little woolly jacket I knitted, crying as I was. I'd give it to some poor child, but I knew well we'd never have another. Our first death, too, it was. We were never the same since. Oh, Carol, I, 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 I am not going to cry myself in the glooms about that anymore. I wonder why he wouldn't stay the night. I felt all the time it was somebody strange he brought. Instead of roving around the city, meeting God knows who, night walkers and pickpockets, his poor mother wouldn't like that if she was alive. Him ruining himself for life, perhaps. Still, it is a lovely hour. So silent. I used to love coming home after dances. The air of the night. 
they have friends they can talk to. We've none. Either he wants what he won't get, or it's some woman ready to stick her knife in you. I, I hate that in women. No wonder they treat us the way they do. We are a dreadful lot of bitches. Well, I suppose it's all the troubles we have that makes us so snappy. Mm -hmm. I love flowers. <laughs> I'd, I, I'd love to have the whole place swimming in roses. Oh, God of heaven. There is nothing like nature. The wild mountains and then the sea and the waves rushing and, and the beautiful country with the fields of oats and wheat and, and then all kinds of things, the, the fine cattle going about. Now that would do your heart good. Rivers and lakes and flowers of all sorts, shapes and sizes and smells and colors springing up even out of the ditches, primroses and violets. Natured it is. And as for them saying, there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for them. Why don't they go out and create something themselves? I often ask him. <laughs> the atheists or whatever they call themselves, they go and wash the couples off themselves first, then they go out in front of the priest and they die in. And why? Why? Because they're afraid of hell on account of their bad conscience. Ah, oh, yes. I know them well. Who? was the first person in the universe before there was anybody that made it at all. Huh? Who? Uh, that they don't know. Uh, neither do I. But, so there you are. They might as well try to stop the sun from rising tomorrow. <laughs> the sun shines for you, senorita. <laughs> He said, now that was the day. We were lying among the rhododendrons on Hot Hedge in the gray tweed suit and the straw hat. The day I got him to propose to me. Yes. First, I gave him a bit of seed cake out of me mouth. And it was leap year. Like now, yes, 16 years ago. My God, oh, after that long kiss, uh, uh, I near lost my breath, yes. He said, I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, so we are all a woman's body, flowers all. Yes, that was the one true thing he said in his life. That and the sun shines for you today. Yes, that was why I liked him. Because I saw he understood or or felt what a woman is. And I knew I could always get round him. <laughs> and I gave him all the pleasure I could till he asked me to say yes. I wouldn't answer at first. I only looked out over the sea in the sky. I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. Mulvey and Mr. Stanhope and Hester and Father and old Captain Groves and the sailors and playing all birds fly and I say stoop and washing up the dishes. That's what they called it on the pier at the sentry in front of the governor's house with that 
thing round his white helmet. Poor devil, he was half roasted. And the Spanish girls laughing and, and laughing in their shawls and their tall combs. And the auctions in the morning, the, the Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs and the devil knows who else from all the ends of Europe and Duke Street and the foul market all cooking out of your larby sharons and the poor donkey slipping half asleep and the vague fellows in the cloaks asleep in the shade on the steps and the big wheels of the carts of the bulls and the old castle thousands of years old and those handsome moors Standing all in white and turbans like kings, asking you to sit down in their little bit of a shop. And Rhonda, with the old windows of the posadas, two glancing eyes, a lattice hid <laughs> for her lover to kiss her through the iron. And the wine shops half open at night and the castanets and the night we missed the boat at Algeciras. The watchman going about serene with his lamp. Oh, that awful deep down torrent. Oh, and the sea, the sea crimson sometimes like fire and the glorious sunsets and the fig trees and the Alameda gardens and all the queer little streets and the blue and pink and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jessamine and the geraniums and cactuses. And Gibraltar, as a girl, where I was, a flower of the mountain. Yes, when I put the rose in my hair, like the Andalusian girls used, or shall I wear red? Yes. <laughs> and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall. And I thought, well, as well him as another. And I asked him with my eyes to say, ask again, would I? to say, yes, my mountain flower. <laughs> and at first, I put my arms around him, yes, and I drew him to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad, and I said, yes. I said, yes, I will. Yes. Hello, <laughs> and thank you for staying with us. My name is Jersey McDaniel. Um, I'm lucky enough to have been the Molly Bloom for the Rosenbach Museum and Library for the past, I'm not going to tell you how many years, but ever since Bloomsday began. How about that? Do the research yourself. I'd like to thank them. I'd like to thank you. Happy Bloomsday. Just 
a song at twilight when the lights are low and the flickering shadows softly come and go though the hog you weary sad the day Just a song at twilight when the lights are low and the flickering shadows softly come and go. Though the heart be weary, sad the day. As the sun sets here on Delancey Place, the sun is also setting on our 28th Bloomsday Festival. Every year I have the pleasure of coming out here to thank the thousands who gather in Delancey Place, sitting in chairs under the shade trees or enjoying our beer garden or shopping in our shop. This year, those thousands are with us, but they're with us in spirit, of course. You are those thousands, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Many of you have joined us from your homes in Philadelphia or the region, but others from across the country or even across the world. And I can't thank you all enough for taking the time to join us today. You are the ones who make Bloom's Day what it is. Of course, there's some others who quite literally make Bloom's Day. The staff and volunteers of the Rosenbach have an enormous job every year to pull off Bloom's Day. In the interest of time, I will mention only one of them this year, Ed Pettit, our manager of programs. Why does Ed work on Bloom's Day? Well, Bloom's Day is quite literally our biggest program. It's the best example we have of taking an amazing collections object Joyce's manuscript of Ulysses and turning it into something fun and compelling for participants like you. There are other people I want to thank. The singers, the musicians, they add so much beauty to this incredible story over the course of the day. And then the many readers. This year we had fewer readers, but they read longer passages. They worked harder. They had to take videos of themselves from their homes. We have readers from Philadelphia. We have readers from across the country and readers from around the world. Thank you, all of you, for making Bloom's Day a special festival this year. And last but not least, it costs money to put on Bloom's Day. All of you know that, even when there aren't chairs sitting in the street and t-shirts being sold and other things. I have to thank first and foremost the Government of Ireland through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Kieran Madden, the Consul General in New York, Dan Mulhall, the Ambassador of 
Ireland, the United States, Niall Burgess, the Secretary of State, all of our colleagues in the Irish government, year after year, have lent their support to this enterprise. Just as the sun is shining on me, quite literally, it should be shining on them and reflecting on them. And last but not least, I can't not thank the one person who has made Bloom's Day what it is over the last 28 years, more than any other person, Lenny Steiner, our vice chair and the chair of our Bloom's Day committee. She embodies Bloom's Day. I know she's watching today. I know she'll be back here in Delancey Place next year, waiting to greet you and thank you. So I thank her from the bottom of my heart. If you're inclined to join her and make a contribution, there's a link right here. Thank you again. Happy Bloom's Day. We'll see you next year. Bloom's Day 2020 is made possible through a generous grant from the Consulate General of Ireland's Immigrant Support Program. This project is also supported through the Pennsylvania Humanities Council, the federal state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Special thanks to Lenny Steiner and Perry Lerner and to the South Jersey Celtic Society. Thank you so much for supporting Bloom's Day 2020.